I'm delighted to be joined by former Miller's defender, Guy Branston. Guy, thank you for joining us. No, no, thank you. Thanks for asking. Uh, it's a pleasure, mate. Pleasure to have you on. Just firstly, how's, how's lockdown treated you? Obviously, we're coming to, towards the end of it now, but how's it treated you? Yeah, it's, it's been business as usual, really. I've, I've ticked along, I've got my head down, been able to get to games from a job, um, loans manager at Leicester City, so been able to get to games, get around the players, um, obviously safe distance and make sure everything's all right there and uh, kept in contact with them over the, the period and basically just been doing my job probably about 25% less game-wise when I'm watching them and um, not being able to get to as many live games as normal because of obviously the situation that's been going on. But yeah, I haven't seen much much change. Obviously, family-wise, it's been a bit different because of, of schooling and, and homeschooling, but there's been dips of, of um, desperation between us as a group, but other than that, as a family, we've been we've been absolutely fine and we've been safe, which is the most important thing. Everything's been um, looking after itself. Everyone's been getting on with the little little things we do in the house, and everyone's been getting on with it outside of football. So it's been good. Hopefully, a return to normality as well, starting from this week with obviously kids going back to school and so on. Hopefully, we'll start to slowly get the country back up and running. Um, <laughs> yeah, we, we we do hope that, but it's uh, as long as as long as people aren't getting sick, I'm not I'm not in a rush to get back to the pub or anything like that. So it's <laughs> not really that I'm not really in desperation of, of as long as people aren't being sick and getting poorly after you know hope, on hopefully a, a, a different spike that might pop about. Yeah, hopefully we can, uh, like I say, get through it safely and then get back to normal when it's safe to do so. But we'll just start then, obviously, back at... You started, obviously, your career at Leicester, am I right in saying that? You started at Leicester and then you you, you ended up on a loan spell at Rotherham United and then, and then signed permanently at the Millers. Just kind of throwing all the way back to the start, really, at Rotherham. What, what made you sign for the Millers and what you know what enticed you to go and play for Rotherham United? We had a, a, a goalkeeping coach at Leicester City called Seamus McDougall, who, who obviously played for Rotherham back in the day. Um, he was a goalkeeper with Breck in the, um, the the 80s, 70s and 80s. He's a Rotherham lad as well. And um, he always mentioned that, that they liked me, um, but they were in, I think it was like the conference and division three at the time or four at the time. So I know there was a bit of a... a an interest in me then, but it was, it was probably a year or so early for me to go out on loan. And then I started going out on loan and um, they, they come back in, you know, Shane's contacted me and said, look, you know, Breck's been on the phone. Would you be interested? And and I'm like, well, I'll go and play anyway, really. I wanted to get some more game time in, under my belt. And the game time was so important. They promised that. And I spoke with Breck and John, um, spoke with Breck and um, Ronnie and they sold it to me. And, and I, I turned up and, and felt right at home as soon as I walked in the door. There were good people about the place. The lads were great to me. Said you kind of grabbed me straight away. Monkey grabbed me straight away. Dave Artell, Dan Hudson, you know, then them four kind of grabbed hold of me straight away, being the young lads. Um, and we kind of went straight on from there and made the first team and we went on a great run. I think it was, uh, we were 10th in the league when I got there and we started getting in the playoffs and we started like getting up the table when, when things started going well in that first season. So it's brilliant. You obviously speak about coming into that team. There's, there's quite a lot of characters in that team. And I think as a as a Rotherham fan as well, there's it's quite a, a famous era of, of players, obviously the, the players you've mentioned, the likes of Adam Lee, also Paul Warren, current manager Richard Barker and so on. Uh, then there's like Swales and McIntosh and, and other players. I know there's a countless list that I could go on about, you know, that, that lots of Miller fans will know. Just what was it like coming into that dressing room and you know what was it like being in a dressing room with so many characters, really, you're a bit of a character yourself, obviously, in your career. Uh, just how did you find it in that dressing room? Well, I settled in straight away because of the people that were there, like Polly. I mean, if we're taking it right back to the start, that like Tosh and Swales weren't there, like, Alan Lee wasn't there, so they came in the following season. So the characters are already around, were like Leo Fortune, where's Darren Garner? I mean, everyone had their own little uh, quirk or own little um, personality. So like Dylan, uh, Paul Dylan, Mark Williams, you know, Chris Beach were like big Clifton boys, always in the pub. Uh, Andy Roscoe would, would turn up still from years ago, but still turn up because he loved the Sunday club. And we'd go like, we'd go and socialise and mix and, and be together as a group. Um, if it wasn't a Saturday night, it was a Sunday night. If it weren't a Sunday night, it was a Monday night. There was always something going on. 
So when I came into the building, I was living at the Swallow, which is now the Holiday Inn on the roundabout, as you come into Rotherham. And, you know, there's a few lads already living there and the gym was there. So we'd all go to the gym after training. And, and I was already upstairs in the hotel room. So there was quite a vibrant group of lads willing to communicate. And like I said, everybody had their own little thing. You know, if there was always someone quite interesting, even if you sat with them on the bus or randomly, you know, picked a group of lads to talk to. It wasn't um, any clicks. It wasn't, you can't speak to us because we're this or that, which I've been at clubs and it's like that. So I came in pretty settled about men's football because I've been around it a few years now. Um, I played in a reserve league that played you really young. And if you cope with men's football as a youngster, you kind of got bumped up pretty quick. So I would played, I think it was senior league at like 14 and coped with it playing senior league and Leicester got wind of that and told me off for it uh, because I've been playing against men as a, so young and I've been playing up front and scoring goals and stuff like that. So the physicality side didn't, didn't shock me. So when I got into a men's dressing room, I kind of understood what it was about. And I, I got in there pretty early as 16 when I was at Leicester, 17 when I got in the reserves at Leicester. By the time I got to Rob Room, you know, people doing what they did in the dressing room didn't really shock me. And I think that, exposure to certain levels of men's football is, is a great tool to understand where the lads are at. So when I got into the dressing room with the, with the characters and I'd already formed my own character, and I think that's the, the thing a lot of these kids miss and the transition takes longer because they come into the dressing room without that background that, that, that's similar to mine or, or a variation of mine. And I think that a lot of these these kids that go to these tra- these rooms where they're a bit shocked by what's going on because the exposure's not been there or or safety exposure to it. And some of the lads that I come across when I, when I first signed for Rotherham was, would shock a lot of people uh, just for the, the sheer sheer the, the sheer mental states of some of them. I mean, you know, we've got some great characters there and, and, and I'm being positive when I'm talking about mental states. They were just lovely guys, like, but they're off the wall compared to some of the kids I come across these days and, some of the players I meet these days, they were just like borderline crazy, some of them. But we had so much fun in everyday training and so much enjoyment after training that you just wanted to turn for work every day. Do you think that fun and then and that attitude of wanting to turn up for work contributed, obviously, then on the pitch? Obviously, you loved it that much that you couldn't wait to get in and obviously the results then you know, transpired on the pitch as well, didn't they? Yeah, you're getting... Um, you get, you're building the modern terminology, you know, culture, environment, you know, processes. You know, we were doing, you know, periodization training and, and well before it was, it was worded, you know, we had a process, a policy, you know, a protocol before it was all worded. You know, we had all these things to stick to, but we stick to them in, in, in the, the remits of, a, you know, self-discipline, which is something that a lot of the lads had. We knew what we needed to do to perform on a Saturday afternoon. And we lived our lives accordingly to that, depending on when the games were. And we made sure that we, you know, we delivered on the training pitch because we worked very, very hard. Um, we, we all pushed each other. You know, I remember some of the running that we used to do was was next level fitness levels. You know, Rob Scott, Paul Warren, Daz Garner, Sedge, Munkhouse, Richie Barker coming into the park. You know, all these guys were, were ridiculous fitness levels. Will Varte. You know, Leo Fortune West could run all day, you know. So you, you've got to be up there with them to to really have that capacity to, to train as hard as you did and live as hard as you did off the pitch. But then also, you know, turn up for training physically ready to go again because the trainings were hard as a, as a youngster to go and do the running on a Tuesday and then play on a Wednesday and then play on a, you know, on a Saturday and then play on a Monday. Play on a, you know, it, it became hard work, but a, but a really enjoyable time because you got your time away from the football club and you switched off. But then when you knew that you had to go to work the next day, you was ready for action because you'd done your you know, mental recovery, but you'd also done your physical recovery. And obviously that team was was led by the King, Ronnie Moore, obviously the, the, lots of Rotherham fans will, will, will hold in such high regard and John Brecking. Just what was it like, you know, playing for, for Ronnie and Brex and what were they like as, you know, as, a, as maybe mentors to you as, 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 a young, as a younger player coming into that team? In your career, um, they weren't. I wouldn't say they weren't. They were. They were, they were obviously very, very good. Um, 
you know, they, they know exactly what to do. Um, they've gone through it. They've been there, done it as players, but they'd also started to do it as managers. Um, Ronnie had obviously worked with Ian Porterfield, who'd been very successful. Uh, Brecken had obviously worked with lots of successful managers at, at Rotherham and been there all his life and knew the club through and through and knew the staff. You know, we've got um, Phil Enson at the, above us. There's like the CEO who'd obviously been around the club all his life. And there was good people to speak to if, if there was a problem, but there weren't many problems, if I'm honest. There was some just some good people kicking about. And we just hit the ground running. Um, they got, they'd done reasonably well in the cup runs before. So they knew they were kind of had a, a, a good core of players um, still around the, the club. And then they added to it that they improved it. And I come into it um, in November time and we went on a run of keeping clean sheets and I added a bit of so-called steel to the place. And, you know, we had some good players around us. Don't get me wrong, Will Varte, you know, Vans Warner, uh, Paul Dillon, but they didn't have a, a me type in that, in that defensive line. You know, Brian Wilsterman, people like that. So I added a bit of steel to it. I won the first contacts. I won balls. What probably they didn't win at the time where they conceded an extra goal or two. And, and I kept clean sheets because I helped Polly out and put my body on the line in front of Paul. And, and he was missing that a bit. So I had something different to the, to the lads. And I nicked a few goals as well, which was something that, that they weren't doing as an added extra. So the added things that I added were, were helping Ronnie and, and Breca. So they took me under the wing, helped me out in, in accommodation. They, they looked after me as a lad. And, you know, the famous story is that, you know, I signed with a court case hanging over me. So I ended up having a, a, a go and miss training from time to time for this court case. And I ended up doing that um, and getting off with that, which I thought I would anyway, because it was a load of bullshit. But it was a, it was the pressure of that and the pressure of all the other things just kept me focused on football because I didn't take it for granted. I, you know, I really wanted to do well at Rotherham and, you know, we ended up winning promotion, which was unbelievable. You talk about promotion, obviously. I'll take you back to, to Hartlepool away. Obviously, you scored the goal that, that clinched promotion up into, uh, up into Division 2, wasn't it, at the time? Um, when the Millers were in Division Three, just what was it? What was that feeling like? You know, just to score the goal that, you know, just to clinch promotion. Yeah, I was in good form. Um, I've been been nicking a few goals in training and been practicing on a few routines. We had Rob Scott who could throw the ball a mile, and it was a massive asset because we got balls into good areas. Uh, we played good football. There was no doubt. It. Kevin Watson who played good football. We had Trevor Berry, Darren Garner can all play football. You know, these are good. These are good, good footballers. If you're talking about them now, they're worth a lot of money in in, in the grand scheme of things in the lower league. So, we, we, when we wanted to play, when we had time to play, we would do. But the the goal that I scored was from a you know a set piece that we were famous for. You know, Rob Rob Scott would go and dislocate his shoulder by throwing the ball so far, and I, and I knew what areas he to hit. You know, we worked on it in training, got on really well with Rob, and still do. And um, got onto it and flicked it in with me right foot following. It was very close, but I, I was, I'm quite a reactive lad. I'm quite sharp when it comes to reactions. So I knew that was coming in and I thought, all right, I'll get my foot to this and dobbed in front of a couple of people and just got close to the, uh, the post and flicked it in. And I'll never forget it. And I ran straight to the crowd and everyone was jumping on my back. And it, I, I recently watched it the other day because someone sent it me. But yeah, it's still... There's a lot that that game was a big game for us because there was a lot of pressure on it, and um, it was an old. My old manager was the manager at the time, uh, Chris Turner and Colin West, my old teammate. So it was good to go and play well against them and score against them. But that goal clinched promotion, which then took us into the Swansea game, which was one-one, and we had obviously the crowd trouble and Paul had lost his life. So I never forget that. And there's just so many memorable moments. Um, it's amazing how it imprints on you and. And makes you want more. You know, I think I think people who have never been successful in sport can't understand why they just keep going or let's go again, let's go again, let's go again. Because the feeling you get from stuff like you've just explained, it's just madness. It's it's like it's that high, it's that that drug you need all the time. And like my missus tells me she's listening and now probably my missus tells me to calm down sometimes when I'm getting excited about certain projects or certain things because it's the build-up towards it. And then when the high comes, then you're looking for the next thing. 
And that's the thing a lot of people can't understand. You've got to go again, you've got to go again, you've got to go again because you want that build up and you want that high and you want that success because it's so damn good because it lasts so long. I'm still talking about it now, 20 years on. You know, it's it don't go away this shit. You know, this is this is lives with people for the rest of their lives. So why wouldn't you want it again? And you know, that's why I keep chasing now, even as the loans manager, even as the wannabe manager or wannabe coach that I am. I keep chasing them sports highs and them them life highs because they're great things to have in your locker for when the times are hard to think about and go again. Would you say that that kind of then contributed to the the season after? So I suppose the only the only thing that the recent Millers fans, yeah, of course he does. Compared to that, is the only thing we've really seen compared to that that back to back promotion is when it happened under Steve Evans when we're from obviously League uh, League Two into League One into the Championship back to back, and I think that same group there was was kept together and, and you know and, and added obviously a few players to the squad to to deal with the the level above and and they, and they probably lived off the, the success from the season before to get them up again. Is that kind of what happened at Rotherham? Did did the additions come in and? Yeah, it's a combination. Did they keep the group together? Like you say, did they keep the group yeah, together? Yeah, listen, there are loads of, loads of things have got to align. Yeah, loads of things have got to align. Like, like you just said there, you nailed it. Loads of things have got to align, but they've got to align in a way where you start, like I said to you, start structuring it. You know, we know we've got this good squad. We know we've got these winners. We know we've got this, this and this lad. He can step up. But unfortunately, this, this and this lad can't. So we're going to have to get rid of him and put him in there. And it's about recruitment. It's about, like I said, it's, it's, it all sounds modern, but people have been doing it for years. You know, people have been watching video clips for years. People have been watching, you know, video recordings for years. People have been doing analytical data for years. People have been watching football matches for years. And we're going through, like, scouting missions for years. All this stuff that everyone keeps talking about, it's like, oh, it's dead modern. No, it's not. It's just different wording. You know, Ronnie Moore used to make us watch the video in a dark room for, for 15, 20 minutes every so often about what we're doing right and what we're doing wrong. Ronnie Moore used to make us watch video clip after video clip of our successful clips, you know, and, and we used to go through it and we used to go, look, what are you doing there, Brian? I'm rewind it and start it again, rewind it and start again. We'd be there for days sometimes because the video recorder was crap. But we, he'd bring in this big TV and, and, you know, break the clips down. And we had John Bilton there. If you, I mean, his name doesn't get mentioned enough for how, how advanced he was in his training sessions. John Bilton was miles ahead of, of anyone I've dealt with in football. And this is a guy, right, who, who you look at him and he's like 65, 70. Even in the 90s, he was 65, 70. He's probably the same age now, 65, 70. But he brought some stuff to us and we're all going, what the fuck is this? And we'd, have, we'd, we'd be on him. But you were allowed to talk like that back then. And be like, Bilts, what the fuck are you doing here? Like, this is fucking crap. But then you realise what he's doing. And I, I, I lapped it up. You know, I'd, I'd started to see it at, at Leicester City before I left. Because, they, you know, they spent a fortune on, on a physio that ended up being there for 20 odd years called Dave Wren, who's only just left now. And, you know, I started to see some of this stuff and Bilts was miles ahead of, of him. So it was good to see that, that we were like modern in our, in our training sessions and modeling our thought patterns and how we broke down um, physical data and how we broke down, uh, I would say, our recovery. You know, we had obviously Dennis Circuit there, who again, doesn't get mentioned. You know, these are all intricate people within that culture to then build the, the, the I would say the foundations to then build on all this success because without the players on the pitch, keeping them fit, keeping them, you know, mobile, keeping them recovering quickly, we, we had a small squad, grand scheme of things. You know, we didn't have all the money that, say, Swansea had or, or Reading had in the second division um, in, the, in the following season. Millwall had. You know, we were lads on 600 quid a week. You know, back then it sounds, sounds you know, a lot, but grand scheme of things, there was lads on four, five, six, seven, eight grand a week, every week. And, and the, people were getting highly paid to, play, to win divisions, to get promoted a week, and went through the divisions and they were getting highly paid. And I think Reading were on highly paid money. And, you know, unfortunately, if you pay, if you pay slightly more, you get better, better quality of player. So Ronnie Moore was pulling up trees with, with his recruitment, uh, with Dawes's, um, with Graham Dawes's recruitment, who was the scout at the time, with Brecken's hours in the car, watching football matches, with Ronnie Moore going out most nights, watching games. They were miles ahead of their time with, with the, some of the stuff they put together. 
in terms of Ronnie and Brex, was it was it Brex that that led heavily on the training field, and then and then Ronnie more of the the man management type, or did did, did they mix it up? Or yeah, there was there was times where you know you, you you'd see Ronnie on the pitch, training pitch. I mean, Ronnie, I think I think management is very different to coaching. And that's what I've learned going through the years of being involved in football. Management is different to coaching. Coaching is different to management, you know, and, and yes, they cross-pollinate, but the, the, the greatest managers don't need to be on the, on the training pitch. You know, but they, they can leave the guys to it. They know what sessions they're getting out. They know what um, information that they're being delivered back. They, they scan over it, but, but as the, the training session is going on, they're pulling lads out, they're speaking to lads, they're, they're they're in meetings, they're coming back into the training centre, they're doing bits. I mean, Ronnie could turn up half 10, 11, and he knows that the lads will be warmed up, ready to go for the session he's going to put on. But nine times out of 10, I would say, eight, say eight times out of 10, Ronnie would be on the training pitch with us, doing the sessions, enjoying the lads' company. But also, you know, before you know it, that's an intricate part of rapport building, you know, empathy-driven banter, you know, having a laugh with the lads, targeting some of them who aren't doing it, but also bigging some up who are doing it. Loads of different stuff you you, you go through, you, you look through where other managers have failed. They seem to have a system that worked for them that produced quality in the week that led to the Saturday. And there's no coincidence that if you have a good week of training, your performance levels will be high on Saturday afternoon. There's no coincidence. It's, it's, it's absolutely imperative that the training sessions are good to then lead to the Saturday afternoon's performance levels because lads take so much confidence from scoring loads of goals in training into the Saturday afternoon or defending well in training to then take into the games on the Saturday afternoon. You know, you've just got to obviously manage the legs part of it and the physicality part of the training sessions to leave lads hungry for more on the Saturday afternoon because the older you get, the more... It, training takes it out of you leading into the Saturday afternoon. So you've just got to be clever with your training, which again, we had modern, modern ideas from experienced guys. Did the, did the staff and, and the players believe that the, the back-to-back promotion was possible? Obviously you spoke about the budget not being as big as some of the other clubs in the division, but yeah. I believe that was... I, I'll tell you now, we didn't, we didn't think, we didn't think about it, mate. I'll be honest with you. We, we no, not, I didn't think that we were in a. I didn't think we were in the 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 promotion push. We just kept getting on with it. We kind of we kind of joked loads of times. Even Warner, Polly, myself, you know, uh, we joked that we we were we were really poor sometimes. Some of our performances we put on where we'd win two one or three one or we beat teams. We're like, how the fuck did we win that? I mean, the biggest performance to click all together in the first season was the the Boxing Day game against Peterborough, who were flying, because they were the big payers, they were the boys, they they had all these stars, they had Simon Davis, Matt, Matt Elling, um, Etherington, a um, few other guys kicking about, I think even um, Bullen was playing at the time, and we absolutely backed up 5-0. And we walked off and we went, wow, how the hell has that just happened? And, you know, we, and that's 10,000 at Peterborough United, you know, on a, on a boxing day. And that made me think Peterborough were a big, big club because I grew up playing against Peterborough, luckily in the reserves and stuff like that. And I ended up signing for them three times because I loved the place. So to go there and, and, and play against them and beat them 5-0 uh, was, was amazing because, we, we you know, they were a big club in the lower leagues. So Barry Fry bought them and he, he brings a bandwagon with him of, of um, celebrityness and... and and uh, and he's Barry Fry, and he's a great guy to work for, by the way. And them sorts of things um, were amazing. So to beat them, to beat Barnet, you know, we we kind of just kind of winged it the first season, and then we went into the second season massively underdogs of anything. So we didn't really think about getting in and around the, the top end because if you can remember, I think we actually get battered by Cambridge to start the season. Uh, Butler scores. Um, I think his name is Zummer Abbey went to, to Norwich he scored we got battered like five something five two or something and we were all like looking at each other going we're shit like we are fucking terrible we're going to get dicked this season and I can remember it like we're in the dressing room Ronnie's going mad 
the guys are going mad at everyone. And, and we hadn't started the season very well. We ended up like, after that, that galvanised us to go, well, we better pull us, like, we, we've kind of tossed off the summer. We've been Falaraki too much. You know, <laughs> we had a great time. I think I went on about four holidays, come over about stone overweight. So we, we kind of like, we kind of had a good rest in the summer. And we thought, wow, wow. Like our, our fitness levels haven't kicked in yet, but we did that much fitness work in pre-season for that season that we were absolutely flying in and around in October, November and running people off the clock. You know, you talk about, again, you talk about modern science, sports, science, things like that. You know, we had one guy who did everything. He didn't need to do a presentation on sports science to bore the lads, you know, to death. He just went, right, you do this running, you'll get these results. And we just bought into it that way. And we, so we did us running on a Tuesday. We was ready for Saturday. We did a Saturday running um, after the game if you didn't play, ready for the Monday's reserve game. Lads just bought into it. And if you've got good lads, like I said to you, if you've got good lads in the building, you can take on, you know, an extra 15, 20 points a season because they seem to deliver for you. When was it then that you kind of started to believe that, you know, that the promotional might be on? Was it towards the back end? Uh, I, I was getting a lot of press um, January, February uh, because of how well I was playing. I was left-sided, I was 21. Um, and I had a few clubs watching me from the Premier League again because obviously I'd gone back. I dropped down and then got two promotions and it looked like the second promotion was coming. So I was getting a lot of press. I was getting a lot of agents ringing me up. Um, didn't really know what was going on. I was only young. Didn't really have any guidance from the parents because parents didn't really know what it was about. Um, I'd met a couple of guys who I knew from previous clubs who were saying to me, look, you know, this is serious. Like, this, you know, th these are... This is what happens when you, you're picking up, you know, the, the, the plaudits you're getting. I was keeping clean sheets, scoring goals. So I knew something was happening in January, February, but I didn't really realise what, what. And, and of course, we were like right up there, keeping, keeping a steady stream of points each month. Um, the form was reasonable, reasonably good, but we were just keeping in with the, with the pack. We wasn't winning the race yet, which is important. And then we played Liverpool, um, January the 9th my birthday we went to Liverpool and we put on a really good show um, we, we listened we lost 3-0 but they went and won six championships that, that year you know the league um, sorry not the league they won the, um, the all the cups that they were in Super Cup and all sorts of things Europa Cup and, and we played against them like the league leaders and I was I did I played well the, all the lads played well so the kind of spotlight turned on well, Rotherham are decent, you know, as well. They, they've got a right chance of promotion. And then you start reading the press. But that excited me as, a, as an individual rather than, you know, got a bit hyped up by it all. I, I wanted more. Again, like I said to you earlier, I wanted more of that. I didn't want less. I wanted more. I wanted more attention. I wanted more press. I wanted more. And that only comes from playing well, training well, and, and kind of just said, well, right, you know, have a, have a good four months now from February till the end of the season. And, and don't leave anything on the training pitch and don't leave anything in the matches and see where you actually go in the summer. And we had like probably eight or nine of us who fought like that. So we kind of like said to the lads who probably weren't in the team regular like we were, like stick with us, like believe in the process, believe in what we're doing and we'll make sure that, that we get there at the end and then everyone gets looked after. Because as much as you want to leave a football club at the end of the season when you haven't played as many games, you're in a much better position if you leave a football club that's just been promotion, uh, just been promoted, than you leave a football club that's just been relegated. And uh, I think a big, a big emphasis, I think a big emphasis on that was was we're in this together. And what, regardless of what position you're in or how many games you've played, if you've only played one or two, like BT, you'd only play like three or four games that season. But with them games that he came in for, say, whoever missed a game on right back, centre mid or, or, or centre half, he came in and was like, unbelievable. He did like, unbelievable for us. So people like that weren't appreciated in the grand scheme of things, but to us as a squad, they were. And he was somebody that, that, that I always remember thinking, do you know what? What a good pro you are. You like, you keep yourself super fit. You train your nuts off. You're great around the lads. You're a great person off the pitch. You know, it, all these different things he had in his locker that helped the group. 
like Monkey, Monkey not really burst onto the scene yet. He was another one. Uh, Dave Artell just burst onto the scene that season. Uh, sorry, the second season. And all these different things started to like click into place that the younger lads had learned off the older lads. And the older lads are kind of like moving away. And the group was getting younger, but it was also getting very excitable. With, with like, we even had young Barks coming into the scene, training with us every day, who ended up becoming an important part. So there was lots of uh, positivity around the place. And, and Alan Neal was becoming a really important part of the coaching staff as well. And, you know, it just started to change. And we just started to look at it and go, we're good. We're quite good as. You know, like a realization, obviously. It's like it's interesting to hear you talk now. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it's, no, no, no. I don't know if I broke up a little bit there. Um, it's quite interesting to hear you say, you know, about having a group of, of good people and good people together and having, you know, a group that works hard and trains hard and, and then starts to, to slowly believe. It's that quite similar, isn't it, to the to the current squad that we've got now. Paul Warren talks a lot about having a good group of players together that work hard and, and are starting. Yeah, there's, 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 there's a thing. For- there's a thing for me that, that I kind of laughed about when I was listening to the rugby lot, you know, um, the All Blacks. Yeah. And they're the best of the best players anyway, right? They're the best of the best players. And I think it's easy to see good players. I think it's, you th- I think we can all see good players. It's, it's difficult to, to manage the rest of it around it. Yeah. So the recruitment, like I work in recruitment. I work with, with lads every day. I can see the good players. I can see they're going to fit in a certain level at the, at the cost of the the, the, the season, say, to, to where they might fit in the future for themselves. So I can see that. That's, that, that's what I've got. It's a skill set of mine. It's a skill set of a lot of people, you know, not just me. But the stuff that you do behind the scenes, putting them on the pitch, the development of, of them off the pitch, the, the, the mental state of why they're doing it. You know, Warney talks about why a lot. You know, why, why are they there? Why are they here? We were doing that years ago. You know, what... I, I, we were all doing that yet again. We're all doing that years ago, but we didn't know the, the terminology or the phrase or, or the wording for it. We're all doing it. You know, Warney was talking about 1% 25 years ago. You know, if he'd wrote a book 25 years ago, he'd probably get laughed at. If he'd wrote a book, you know, now, everyone's going, oh, what, great. Mate, he was doing that. He was doing some of this stuff years ago. Use all the stuff he's still doing. As he's gone along his journey and, and improved, don't get me wrong, he's improved, but I still talk to Warning. We're still talking the same as we was when we were teammates. It's fantastic. It was interesting to see where Warney went, you see, because a lot of the stuff that he did was, was fitness orientated in his exit strategy coming out of football. Yeah. And he was somebody that that personally I, I looked at as as a really good person to talk to when I was a player because he had a lot of stuff going on off the pitch that, that really enticed me to get involved with it, like the housing, because he was doing his housing. Richie Barker was doing the housing. So, so they're, all, they're all good pros in their own little ways. And, and he, was, he was one of the, the better ones. But he, like I said to you, it was, it was inevitable he was going to go and be a leader of something. And when he went into teaching, it was, you know, coaching started going that route and management started to go down that route. And, you know, more empathy became into football, which was good. Which is always a positive, um, and but he still had that streak in him that, that wanted to win, and, and he's got that now, which is obviously good. And if you get a group of good people involved in a in a, a project, a good solid group of people, then you've got a right chance of success, in my opinion. Yeah, does he talks a lot, Paul Warren, about about good people, like saying obviously it makes it a little bit clearer hearing from yourself, been in the dressing room, obviously for, for many years, why it's so important to get. You know, them good people in that dressing room. Um, just like I said, going back to the 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 second season with Alan Lee, with Alan Lee goal at the end of the season against Brentford, a, a famous moment in, in Rotherham history, you know, in, in Miller's history, to score late on against Brentford in the 88th minute, I think it was, to, to get promotion. Um, you know, the scenes at Millmore after, just what, what ex- explain, you know, the experience of that day and what it was like. Well, we'd had, um, we'd had a few run-ins with, with uh, Brentford before. They were a good side. Um, I think it was Martin Allen's first season as a manager on his own. He'd left um, Reading. Um, we'd, we'd run into him as a, as a, as a staff member at Reading. And, you know, it was, it, we wanted to win. We all wanted to win. He, he had his funny quirks in the, in the tunnel before games and stuff like that. So 
there was that that he'd, he'd big the game up in his in his mistake in his favour um, to try and g the lads on, and we we'd obviously bit that, and we weren't having them coming to us on our ground and, and taking any points off us. So when it was one one, and obviously Alan cut in and scored the goal, and, and the the nuts environment afterwards because the results had gone our way as well. You know, it was amazing. We had about three days on the piss afterwards. I think it was, and it was it was a relief because we we were obviously aiming towards the end of the season where we'd want to get promotion and come into the the mix of teams where we thought, well, we all done a minute. We're, we're playing sailing now. We we just got to win this game. And, and it, I think when we were asked to turn up and deliver, we did, and we had a lot of fighting as anyway to to wind out results and pick up wins. Like I said to you regardless of performances, which is important of any team. But when we when we played and performed at the same time, we had a good group of lads that when we were singing and dancing, we were hard to stop. And that was one of them performances. Alan Lee was, I'd known him from 14, an Irish boy coming over from Mass to Aston Villa, uh, 14, 15, you know, playing against him in the youth team um, for Aston Villa, knowing exactly what he was about. He was my nemesis in youth football because of who he who he was and how good he was at Villa. And I couldn't cope with him. I say I couldn't cope with him. We'd have we'd have games where I'd I'd win and he'd win and we'd go one one, two one, you know, that sort of stuff. We had so we had mutual respect. So to know he was coming for Rotherham, I knew how good he was, you know, and, and I knew what what his skill set was. So I knew that putting good balls into him to chase and and rag defenders about because he was a big, big guy, um, was good for him. And it was just, again, he was just a lovely guy. He was a very different character um, to a lot of us. He's not intense. He was somebody who, you know, would rather play the guitar than play football. Uh, but his talent and his skill set was, you know, like I said, being physical, running around, getting shots off and, and being an handful. And, and he did that, you know, all his career. He had a great career and, and, he should be very positive in his career. And then, obviously, the season after moving into what is now the Championship, just what was the jump like from, from League One to the Championship? We see nowadays it's quite a big jump, obviously, with the finances involved now, probably, from League One to the Championship. Just what was the jump like back then? Um, I, I find it a big jump, personally. I, you know, I, I lost my place pretty sharp. Um, I felt the players were just totally different to what we've been used to. The overall quality was was there. It was it was foreign based players that, that that were, you know, starting to burst on the scene for us because we'd always kind of played against stereotypical UK sides, and a lot of the bigger teams had loads of foreign players that were just, you know, miles ahead of of of, of tactics and and diving, and and it took me a while to get used to it. I, I felt that it it took me a good six months of of, of some of the ins and outs performances I did, but I also, you know, I looked, I looked back into some of the performances I put in and, you know, I watched um, in lockdown, I watched the Man City game and, you know, and I'm, I'm sitting there like dominating Sean Goater and playing against John Mackey, who's like five million pound striker and absolutely bullying them. And I'm thinking, I wasn't bad me. Like, I could have played championship more regular, but just didn't get a run. And when I did get in the side, I played really well. And, when he went back to the the, the two centre halves because that was his his thing. He had the two uh, centre halves in Tosh who come and join the season, and I found I found it very difficult to cope with being dropped after two promotional seasons and not being spoken to properly, and not being looked after properly, like like because they just didn't do that back then. Like no one really pulled me aside, and there was a lot of messing around going on, and as in from from me as well. But like I was protecting myself because. I just thought they took the piss and Ronnie and Brecker took the piss and, you know, they had took the piss, if I'm honest. I still look back and think they had. And some of the stuff they did to me, like the way they, the way they spoke to me, the way they treated me, there's no respect there for me as, as an individual after I just helped them get promoted twice. But that's the cold, harsh reality of football. You know, you've got to realise that, 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 you know, you're in it for yourself in a team game. So you've got to deliver. So even if they don't treat you right, you've still got to deliver on the Saturday afternoon. You've still got to deliver on the training pitch to get back in the side. Uh, and once I got my head around that, you know, I, I delivered for them. And, you know, I ended up turning it back around. Uh, I missed out 
a few more times. I stayed with them for a couple of seasons because of obviously what had gone on. But, you know, I, it, it left a bit of taste in my mouth of the way I was treated after Tosh had come in. And when me, Tosh and Swaz played together, or, or me and Macintosh or me and Swaz, you know, we did great. And it was, a, you know, still in a good, good club to be around because we were doing well in the championship. So I was very positive about the place and, and, and they were, they're great guys, Ronnie and Breck, and they were doing what they needed to do. But, you know, I think they could have started treating a few of the lads who got them to these echelons of the championship a bit better as well, you know. Did that contribute to you leaving the club in the end, do you think? Oh, 100%, mate, 100%. You know, uh, I think that you've got to respect the players for, for what they do for you. Um, they were cold towards me. Um, I even I used to go and see them and say, look, what can I do more to get in the side? And they didn't seem to be that interested, uh, which again, the cold, harsh reality of football. And it's just one of them things, you know, it's, it was part of the career, part of the, the industry, how they were brought up as players, how they were brought up as staff members. But that's how you treat your people. And, you know, I've got a bit more empathy on the, than that on me, but, you know, that's how they treat your players back then. And I had to deal with it and there wasn't, the PFA to call upon for support. There wasn't all the different things they've got in place now. Football clubs, no one really gives a fuck. You know, and that's that's the grand scheme of it. You've got that in your head, then you realise you've got to look after yourself. So when I had the opportunity of, of going on loan again to other clubs, I did that, played well. Went to Peterborough, played well. Uh, went to Wickham, played well. Um, so loads of positives again came about from it. And so... You know, the twists and turns in my career, I wouldn't change because I, I had some unbelievable twists and turns that, that, that I turned from negative into positive. And, and I don't look back with just, you know, looking back silly and thinking, oh, it was amazing because there were some real dark times. But it, there were some really, really unbelievable opportunities that, that I create for myself by just working hard and getting my head down and getting on with things rather than just buckling under the pressure. And then just looking forward now to, to the to the modern day, to the current Rotherham team. We, we spoke earlier just before we started about how you know Paul Warren, uh, Richard Barker, Matt Amshaw, uh, Andy Warrington, Rob Scott, obviously, who's head of recruitment as well at Rotherham now. So you've played with and, and know pretty well the the, the core of the, the, the staff at Rotherham United now. Just I don't know how much you've seen of the Millers this year, but what do you reckon to the job that, that Paul Warren and the staff are doing? Yeah, look, it's unfortunately the club is a yo yo club. It bounces up and down, bounces up and down. And um, I think that if the fans can understand that, then you might as well keep someone in as good as Paul in the in the job because you've got a hell of a chance to get promoted next season again if you go down. And you've always got a chance of staying in the division because of the quality that, that Warney and the guys add to it. You know, I think you've got good staff with good lads. I think that, that you've got to understand your position in, in, in the, the, the pyramid in the football league. You know, unless Tony wants to chuck some serious dough at it. Because inevitably, you'll get the better quality players. You know, and, and, and that's... If you, want to, if you want to step it up at a level, then that comes with serious money and serious investment, unfortunately. And that's the difference. You know, Rotherham can't compete with the Reading uh, wage budget. And the player inevitably will probably go to Reading because he wants to live near London. So there's all these different things to think about when, when, when fans are going on at people and... and and being disappointed but the lads are pulling up trees to stay in the division the, the performances levels are there they work their socks off they're physically good and I've been impressed with with, with lots of lots of the performances this year by them but I've also been you know there could be improvements there and that, like I said to you that, that comes from just unfortunately being able to sign slightly better quality and you can't just keep going in the bargain buckets and expecting to for, for lads to win promotions and, and perform each week because it's, it takes more than fancy talks and fancy positive chats to get lads to be better than other people. It, it takes more than that. It, it needs the players to be better sometimes. It needs that you, you can't put Usain Bolt against uh, someone who's never ran faster than, than 10 seconds and expect him to beat Usain Bolt because he's, he's had a good positive chat or, or, you know, a good fitness session the week before. It's, it comes from genetics. It comes from attitude and application. It comes from loads of different things. And it comes from them just being slightly better sometimes, you know, as a group. And it's, it's so difficult to keep performing as a, 
as a group when you're up against it and keep picking up wins every week to keep the fans happy. And that's the the the, the knife edge that Warney's on every week because you know that it seems like the fans want to turn against him every time they lose a couple of games, and then all of a sudden he's the best manager ever when it, when he wins one. So make your mind up. You know, are you either happy with him or you're not. You know, and I think that a club like Rotherham, in my opinion, should be very happy with Paul Warren and what he brings to the table for the football club because he's definitely put them back on the map as a club. And and fair dues to Steve Evans. He was he, he did unbelievable for for Rotherham. So since Warney's come back in, there's a feel good factor about the place, and I think the fans will repay that by going in the stands and paying the money when they get the doors open up because. I think that, that, you know, people want Rotherham to do well and people want Paul Warren to do well because they see him as such a good guy. You spoke earlier about Paul Warren saying that obviously you, you thought he would always be a, a leader of some sorts. That I think if, when you play with the other the other members of staff now, Barker and, and Warrington and, and Hampshire and so on, could you see that that they would be involved in coaching or in, in recruitment, say, for Rob Scott in, in the future at some point? Uh, yeah, look... W- one is like I said, been well documented what's said about, but Richie's a, a very clever, clever kid. Um, very serious guy. He was somebody that, that I respected as a player, I respected as a lad. I like I like him a lot. So I could see him doing some serious stuff. He was always educating himself off the pitch. He was investing in houses with his uh, poor brother who obviously passed away recently. A uh, real sad story, but there was always something going on with him that he was off the pitch doing. So I was always interested in what he was up to. So I got to know him really well. Uh, liked him a lot. Liked the journey that he took with his coaching. Did very well with England under twenties. Did a lot of work behind the scenes with with the, the the FA, and became a coach educator. Became a people who you know you could turn to for information about coaching. And very good coach. I've watched him no end. Um, coach for the club when I've been up to watch the training. Uh, not recently because of obviously the pandemic, but previous times when Daniel Everson was at the club um, you know part of that deal as well which is great Rob's Rob's somebody that's um, very busy very vibrant loves being involved with stuff a similar character to me wants to keep winning wants to keep doing well and, and recruitment is a perfect fit for him because he can put a lot of energy into his data and his information that he's got because he's got a lot of information and he can use it for the benefits of the football club and uh, he's got good staff around him you know, there's there's good people there like Chris Trotter now, uh, Warren Spalding, doing some good work for them as well behind the scenes for recruitment. And they're working on this restricted budget compared to a lot of the uh, championship side. So when they're pulling out certain players and they're doing well for them, you know, you need to respect that as well, that they are working on a restricted budget and have to convince these players to sign for Rotherham if another championship club comes in for them because there'll always be more money on the table from the other club. And also they've got to sell that Rotherham's the place for them you know, for their development as players. So recruitment's different to scouting. So it needs a certain type and Rob Scott's a perfect fit for that. Um, yeah, the, I I offered my services to Warney when I was out of work and I said, look, you know, I'll come in for free and, and learn off you guys and, and, and grow off you guys. But unfortunately, he turned it down, which I was quite disappointed with him about, if I'm honest, because I said I'd, I'd, I'd come and work and coach and do a bit for you and do some defending coaching. But, I think um, he had his ideas on getting other people involved he'd worked with and um, he did that, which was great. But, you know, my, my, my heart's always with Rotherham as a football club and, and Morney's a great guy and I'd, I'd worked for him and enjoyed the, the company of Richie Barker again and, and Rob Scott. So, yeah, it would have been an interesting little foursome as a lot. Um, me grafting with the lads and defending with the lads and doing some recruitment work with Warney and Scotty. And I mean, I'm out watching 25... 30 games a week anyway so I was offering my services as a as a friend and, and as a as a, a, a working colleague to try and keep my my coaching going as I as I finished but then Leicester offered me this job so I was pretty much boxed off before I even started entertaining uh, going too deep into trying to persuade Warney into it but it didn't work out one, one they missed out rather than one I missed out I think that's it, yeah, definitely. Um, talking about just talking about obviously that the, you you're coaching, I'd say obviously offering your service to Rotherham, and you, you did a bit of coaching as well uh, after your career, and then going into recruitment. Now, just, just what's 
you know, what does the future hold for Guy Branson? What 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 are your aspirations? Is it to stay in the recruitment side, or would you like to turn into into coaching, into going into obviously in, into managing and so on? Um, yeah, no, I'm learning a lot being at Leicester City Football Club. They're giving me different jobs to do because of my background. They know me as a lad. They know me as a, as a staff member. They know what my work ethics like, and they know I'll do stuff um, to the high high end. So to to be at Leicester City, I'm very proud of. It's something that that's really developed into something that I didn't know it would. It was I was going in there to coach sixteen year olds at the first the first point, and then all of a sudden I'm in the twenty threes. All of a sudden I'm with the loans manual. All of a sudden I'm bumping into Brendan on a regular basis. You know all these different things. The gaffer obviously. So all these different things have opened up for me. And, you know I'm I'm in contact with the, with the the staff and and the twenty three staff because of the loan lads and um, I'm managing the loan lads. So if if and when things open up and there's offers and there's opportunities, then you have to consider them because you, you, I'm ambitious. You know, I want to I want to manage people. I want to manage football clubs. I think I've got a good understanding of a football club running. Um, and my next project, if I'm to leave Leicester, which hopefully I, I keep getting better projects within the club. Um, if I'm to leave Leicester, it's got to be a big project that I can get my teeth into. And it's got to be within the management and the leadership and the the... the the high ends of the the football club, and make sure that you know I'm putting on performances with the with a group of lads that, that I trust and want to put into a a good arena and, and a good football club. Because if you can get that all clicking and ticking together, then you can do great things with it. If you if you're a club that that's struggling for money and that you got bad eggs and it takes you a long time to turn around the the the, the ship from being in a negative route to a positive route I think a lot of the stuff that goes on in football clubs takes time to change and you've got to make sure that the project's right from the from the off and you can really make positive change and I've jumped into jobs before where I should have probably done a bit of digging but needed the money so I needed to take the work and you know it's, it's inevitably bit me on the arse for taking the job but it's bit me on the arse and made me realise I'm not going to do that again you know, I'm not going to, just going to jump into the next job that comes along because I need to work. I'm going to make sure that the, the time I take and the patience I have from what I've learned in the past makes me make the right decision next time. And don't get me wrong, the, the, I made some great decisions along the way, but you also realise that I ain't got to be in a rush all the time to make decisions on, on my future. I think things will just take the path because you start to grow up a bit and start to take your foot off the pedal and realise that you're in a good place, which I am. You know, the grass isn't always green on the other side. And, you know, you, you keep rushing for something that that is over there and it might not be over there and you, you end up missing the stuff that's right in front of you. Well, we wish you uh, every bit of luck, obviously, Guy, with the, with the role that you're in now at Leicester, obviously with future roles that, that you may uh, that you may get throughout your career. We wish you every bit of luck with that. And just a big thank you, really, for giving us your time and coming on and giving an insight into what it was like going through your career at Rotherham United. Some great stories there and a, and a great insight into, you know, those glory years for the club. So, uh, thank you very much. No, no, thank you. Thanks for asking me on. And to all the, uh, obviously, the Rotherham fans that are listening in, I had a wonderful time with you as a player. And you still make me feel very welcome. I still can't believe there isn't a picture of me on the wall as you walk towards the stand. But, you know, that's more of a commercial thing, probably scaring the kids away. It's not good for, you know, bring the fans back. So uh, thanks very much for having me on. I really appreciate it. And all the Robin fans who are listening, you can hit me up on Twitter and I'll always chat to you guys and girls because it's fantastic to be a part of the success in the history of the, the football club going forward. Cheers, Guy. Thank you very much. Cheers, mate. Top man. Great to hear from you, bud.